All right, so we're going to continue our discussion of church history, our survey of Christian history. And uh, so today we're going to get into uh, what, what is really the, the beginnings of the Reformation, sort of the uh, proto-reformers, and then get into uh, to the actual Reformation with Martin Luther. Uh, now, as I've said all along, we're skipping over a lot of stuff, and um, a lot of stuff that even sets the stage for the Reformation to understand it uh, better, but we just can't cover everything. So we're, we're skipping over, like, scholasticism and Thomas Aquinas. He was a major figure in uh, the history of the church, and uh, just a lot of things there. Um, but, so just recognize, recognize there's some, some other areas that need to be filled in as you as you read in the future and, and hear things and study things about church history, you can, you can fill in these gaps, hopefully. So we're going to uh, talk for a few minutes about John Wycliffe, or Wycliffe. Um, it's uh, spelled and pronounced different ways. But um, he was, uh, Bruce Shelley, in his book, says that John Wycliffe was a zealot. And he says, like most zealots, he despised neutrality. So, you know, you just got to go all the way with this. And this explains uh, a lot of his influence as well. Now, it's interesting, we don't actually know a whole lot about him. Um, we aren't even sure about the date of his birth. Um, we believe it to be about the, the mid-1320s to set the stage for you in northern England. We know he was raised there. But he really appears on the scene as a student at Oxford. Again, something we've skipped over is that universities came into existence. Um, they weren't always there, but they came into existence. And so Oxford is there, and uh, he earned a doctorate degree from Oxford in 1372 and became a, a leading professor at the university. Well, one, one of the important uh, issues in his day was this whole idea of dominion or lordship. Um, where did power come from? How, how do people rightfully have power? And remember, this is pretty much a Christian worldview in, in this part of the world at that time. So, so obviously everybody believes it comes from God. The right to rule, the right of authority comes from God. But, but how exactly did it come from God? How, da, how does God transmit the right to rule over um, other men? To man. Um, and so that was one of the, the big discussions of that day. And one of the, as we've already seen, one of the main views of this was that it came through the, the church. That God transmits the right to rule through the church, specifically the, the Roman church, the Bishop of Rome, uh, the Pope, as we've seen. So God, in this view, has entrusted the Pope with. Um, authority uh, with really dominion, with universal dominion was their view. Um, and universal dominion over the church, yes, but as we've also seen, over temporal things as well. So, so really, and we talked about this last time, he, he has authority over all things. So incredible power and authority. Others believed that what was important was not so much that the authority was, was mediated through the church, but that the, that the person who possessed the authority needed to be in a state of grace. They needed to be graced by God. Because in, in, um, in, one of, in the other view that we, we talked about, okay, it didn't really matter if the person was a sinner or not, as long as God they held the position then they could rightfully execute uh, authority. And, and this is why there were such abuses within the papacy, because they're following, one of the reasons why, they're, they're following this theory. Okay? So even if there's, there's sin within the church, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even if there's, there's sin within the pope, if there's corruption within the papacy itself. Right? He's, he's given that position. He's given the right to authority. Well, this other view says, no, the person needs to be in a, in a state of grace. They, they need to be living 
right before God, to have rightful authority, to, to rightfully hold this position. And uh, some of these, including Wycliffe, began to question whether or not, uh, since it was necessary for a ruler to possess grace, just any ruler, okay, any kind of lay ruler or whatever, then certainly that would be true for those within the church, right? I mean, it just makes sense, especially so in the church, right? So he, he wrote a number of books. Uh, one of them was called On Divine Lordship. He wrote in 1375. Another year later was On Civil Lordship. So you see the issue at play, Lordship, who, you know, who has a right to this dominion. Uh, well, by 1377, Pope Gregory XI had condemned Wycliffe's views of, of dominion or lordship. Well, um, Wycliffe, again, is, is living in England, and um, his argument, one of his arguments, was that the English government had the right, the divine right, to correct, and, and responsibility as well, to correct the abuses of the church within its realm, within its jurisdiction. And, and to take those churchmen that, were, that held offices that were corrupt out of the position which they held. So the, the state could go into the church and the government and, and remove people from these positions. They could even seize the property of these church officials who were corrupt. Again, so you, just to set the context... Um, back to what we talked about last time, we saw the incredible power of the Roman Catholic Church. So much so that it was exercising authority over the temporal realm, that is, the civil realm, over civil authority. Even the, even the emperor, the, the pope is saying, okay, you can be ruler today, tomorrow, no, nope, we're going to put a new ruler in place. And so in, in that view, they controlled it, they had complete and total dominion over all things on earth, if you will. That, that was their claim. So here you got guys like Wycliffe coming along and saying, ah, not so quick, you know, uh, that the civil government can actually come in and change things within the church. If the church is corrupt, it has the divine responsibility to do that. And you see, this is why this is this caused problems. You can see why the Pope says, oh, wait, no, that's a, that's a heretical view. So as Bruce Shelley comments, it says, What was drawn from his works, from Wycliffe's works, is that every man, priest or layman, holds an equal place in the eyes of God. The mediating priesthood and the sacrificial masses of the medieval church are no longer essential. You see, you see why this is so dramatic? If Wycliffe is right, and... And you carry through with his views, which is what happened later with the Protestant Reformation, then it just does away with the need of the Roman Catholic Church in the way that uh, it is set up in its theology and practice. So this is very dramatic. In 1378, so this is a year after his views have been condemned, there was what became known as the Great Schism of the Papacy where you had one pope who was in Rome excommunicating another pope elsewhere, so it claimed more than one pope, and so just this, this mockery of even their belief system was taking place. And in light of this, this is Wycliffe, this is his time, this is his context, he becomes even more radical now because he sees the corruption. It's not just theory to him now, he's actually seeing it played out before his eyes. This, this corruption which is taking place. And so he becomes more radical in seeking to reform the church. Uh, so, you know, everything, essentially everything at that time is Roman Catholic Church, so, so what do you do? You don't go down the street to another church. You're unhappy with this one, so you're going to go down the street and join this one. No, there, it's all the Roman Catholic Church, so the, the only hope is to reform it, to correct it, to re correct its abuses. And that's what he was attempting to do. 
So one of the things he pointed out that he believed that those who, who sat in St. Peter's chair, okay, the popes, remember they, they believed they were uh, successors to uh, St. Peter, he said they should be like the apostle, without silver or gold. That's what Peter said, right? Uh, but of course, to do this, the Pope wouldn't have any temporal power. He, he wouldn't have power over the, the earthly realm if he got rid of all of his riches. So he denounced the worldliness and luxury of the Popes. And later, he, he went even further and he said that the Pope was the Antichrist. So uh, he was indeed a zealot. So, in reality, Wycliffe becomes a Protestant reformer before the Protestant Reformation. Now, one thing that brought Wycliffe to this point was his, his view of the church. Um, he accepted the, the division, which was um, from ancient times, really, at least from a long time back, specifically about the church being triumphant in heaven, Okay, those who have died and gone before exist in heaven in a triumphant way. They've overcome uh, this world and this sin. And then there is the church upon the earth, which is called the church militant. So we continue to war, we continue to do battle in our, our lives here. And then sometime along the way, there was, there was added a, a third category uh, that, that there is the church that is asleep in purgatory. And this is Roman Catholic doctrine. Uh, but because there is an invisible church, okay, not just a visible church, which Roman Catholicism really stresses, and this invisible church consists of God's elect, his chosen people, Wycliffe said, it's, therefore it's not the visible church of Rome that gives salvation to people. Salvation comes through this invisible church church, through the gospel working in his people. And so over time, he rejected much of the Catholic doctrine of his day. He did hold on to, to, to some doctrines, like purgatory. He continued to hold on to purgatory. He held to extreme unction as well, though he did say he couldn't find extreme unction in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> so he, he struggled with that. Uh, he was willing to hold on to prayers to saints and, and to images, um, as well as confession, as long as they weren't compulsory. Okay? He didn't want people to be forced to it. But, so he's struggling. I mean, again, this is his worldview that he comes out of, that he's attempting to reform. So he's, he's trying to figure out what needs to be jettisoned, what needs to be kept. But, but to his credit, he at least does attempt to, to look to the Scripture for his beliefs and his, his practices. He also attacked the doctrine of transubstantiation, um, which, of course, is a Roman Catholic view that um, believes that the elements, the, the wine and the bread, are actually transformed into the, the, the body and blood of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, he rejected, again, he's rejecting some pretty major things uh, here with this. In 1380, he published 12 arguments against the idea of transubstantiation. Um, and he argues that the early church actually held to a symbolic view of the elements of Holy Communion. So, so he held that, that Christ wasn't present materially, physically, but sacramentally in, in the elements. Uh, so this was just a bridge too far for most people. This was just too much for many people. And so he lost many of his followers that he had at this point because he just kept on going further and further with this, this Reformation. And, and so many couldn't handle it. And so his, his doctrines were condemned by a council at Oxford. And then the Archbishop of Canterbury led a council that then condemned Wycliffe. But, but he, he was a very popular man, a very popular leader. And um, so, so they had to be careful in the way that they, they handled him at this point. One of the things he desired to see, this is another influence uh, that, that comes from him, he desired to see the Latin Bible translated into English. And that was, in fact, completed in 1382. Uh, he translated the Bible. There's some debate as, as far as 
what exactly, how much of it he translated. Uh, some suggest the entire New Testament, um, while others have helpers translate the Old Testament. But whatever is a monumental um, um, occurrence uh, that 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 came about through this translation of the Bible into English, very very dramatic in the effect upon uh, the the English speaking world. Well, he he had a following of what were called poor priests. Um, they dressed in simple robes of wool, didn't wear sandals, uh, didn't carry anything with them. Um, um, had a long staff in their hand. Uh, you know, they're following the teaching of Jesus and sending forth his, his disciples. Uh, they were dependent on the food and shelter of other people. Uh, their, their enemies called them lollards. And again, this is something you're going to have to look at in, in your own readings, studying, but um, forget a little bit more about it. Lollards means mumblers. And um, what they would do is they, they would carry a few pages of Wycliffe's Bible like a, a track, and uh, in other tracks and sermons uh, as well, as they went about the countryside preaching. And um, many of them were persecuted. And um, as, as they were per persecuted, Wycliffe himself uh, was, was left alone, probably because of his popularity, and he died in 1384. Later on, the Council of Constance declared him a heretic. This was in 1415, so that's about 30 years later. Uh, they said, hey, this guy, continuing influence, obviously. They said, hey, this guy is a heretic. They banned his writings, uh, so they excommunicated him retroactively. And um, the, the council decreed that his works should be burned, and his remains removed from the consecrated ground where he was buried. And um, the order was confirmed by the Pope of that day and carried out in um, 1428. So it took him some time to do this. But, but they did exhume his corpse and they, they burned him and uh, spread his ashes out over the river. So um, obvious hatred for him and his, his doctrines even many years after he was gone. So that's John Wycliffe, um, great influence in the Reformation. John Huss is the other one we will look at before we get to Martin Luther himself. John Huss is in Bohemia, uh, uh, and Wycliffe's movement took root there, so his influence is spread over into the continent. Um, in 1383, so this is the, the year before Wycliffe dies, Anne of Bohemia married King Richard II of England. You know, in that, in that time there were a lot of marriages taking place between the different nationalities, the uh, royalty, and a lot of this was to keep peace and uh, to spread kingdoms and influence and, and this kind of thing. And I'm not sure that's exactly the reason why they married, but a lot of that's going on. So it was a pretty common thing. So this creates goodwill between these, these countries. And so a lot of students of both countries were going back and forth at this time between Oxford and Prague, um, both uh, learning centers. And um, <clears throat> so Huss is there in Prague, and uh, he heard Wycliffe's doctrines, and he ended up embracing them. And I, I can agree with what this guy has taught. Uh, so, um, and you can see he's, he's, uh, he's really a bit later than, a little bit later than Wycliffe, but his Wycliffe's influence is there. He, he, he began to read his writings and em embrace his teachings. Uh, in response to this, again, we're cutting through a lot, but then shortening it up, but in response to this, the Archbishop of Prey complained to the Pope about the spread of Wycliffe's doctrines. Okay, this guy's doctrines are now coming to influence us, so you need to, to do something about him. So the Pope says, okay, well, take care of it. You know, root out the heresy. Take care of it. And so he um, 
excommunicated us, and um, as a result, there was a great popular revolt because Hus was was popular, and um, the result and, and the movement was was growing. The result was that Hus went into exile, and and during this time he wrote his major work entitled "On the Church." See a lot of a lot about the Reformation concerns the church. It's, it's doc, a lot of different doctrines, but the church itself is at play. Why? Because the church in Roman Catholicism is such an important thing. It's, it's the mediating institution between God and man. It's through the sacraments that people uh, experience salvation. Well, Huss was a, urged to appear at the Council of Constance, and um, this was con the, the council that declared Wycliffe a, a heretic, so you know what their feelings were about the whole thing. And he wanted to present his views to the assembly there, but, but upon his arrival found himself that he was going to be the victim of, a victim of the Inquisition. That's not good news, as we've, we've already talked about. Um, Bruce Shelley comments on this, and he says, The rule of the Inquisition was simple. If sufficient witnesses testified to the guilt of the accused, then he had to confess and renounce the errors or be burned. Obviously, they would have been able to find enough people uh, that would have condemned us. And so he would have had to confess and renounce his errors or, or be burned. Uh, so if he confesses, what does he get? Well, he gets life imprisonment instead of being burned at the stake. Um, so in accordance with this rule, he says, the panel of judges appointed by the council believed the witnesses against Huss and condemned him for heresies he had never taught. He was actually condemned for, for heresies that they claimed that he was teaching and he, he had never taught um, those heresies for which they condemned him of. So for eight months he lay in prison in Constance. Um, he wrote a number of letters in that day and then on July 6, 1415, um, the day for his execution, Came. And again, uh, I'll just read from Bruce Shelley. He says, On the way to the place of execution, he passed through a churchyard and saw a bonfire of his books. He laughed and told the bystanders not to believe the lies circulated about him. On arriving at the execution ground, familiarly known as the Devil's Place, Huss knelt and prayed. For the last time, the marshal of the empire asked him if he would recant and save his life said Huss, God is my witness from the evidence that the evidence against me is false. I have never thought nor preached except with the one intention of winning men, if possible, from their sins. In the truth of the gospel, I have written, taught, and preached. Today, I will gladly die. And so he did. Uh, he was martyred. And uh, Bruce Shelley says, if the Church of Rome was to be reformed from within, it had ample opportunities in the 14th and 15th centuries. The value of the period lies in the demonstration it gives that reform of the papal church from within was impossible. And, and that really sets the stage. So these guys, not just them, but there were others with them along the way for, for the, at least these two centuries. Uh, really um, sought to reform the church from within. They said, okay, there's error, there's abuses, we can, we can get this straightened out, we'll, we'll work to do that. And it proved that it couldn't be done. It was not going to happen. Uh, which sets the stage for a man by the name of Martin Luther. And um, Martin Luther also believed that he was going to attempt to reform the church from within, and soon found out that it wasn't going to work. Luther was an Augustinian monk and a doctor of theology. Remember Augustine? We talked about him a little bit. His influence is still coming down. Again, and we talked about uh, the monasteries okay, and how influential they were in all of these leaders. Uh, during this time period were connected with, with monasteries in some form or fashion. 
Well, there were there were these these different orders of of monasteries, if you will, and um, and uh, there was the Augustinian one, and, and Luther was a part of that. Now, as we've seen, there had been this departure from biblical teaching over time, gotten really bad uh, by this point in history, concerning a number of different items, including the gospel itself, including salvation itself. So this makes it uh, very serious. Um, Luther is in Germany now, so we're shifting to another um, geographical locale, and uh, so we're going to see that the, the Reformation now um, begins to appear in, in Germany. Um, Luther, at this time in his life, um, early 1500s, we're going to going to bring us up to 1517, which historically is, is viewed as the beginning of, of the Reformation. Uh, he was specifically concerned with um, a number of th things, but three main things. One was he was concerned with a priesthood that had begun to act as a mediator between the believer and God. Second, he was concerned about the establishment of a pope who would exercise authority over the entire church, as we've seen was taking place. And then he was also concerned about the attainment of salvation through works rather than through faith alone. According to Timothy George, it says in the winter of 1512, Martin Luther began preparation for his lectures on the Psalms. Uh, so, he, so he was a teacher, remember, he's a doctor of theology, so, he, so he's a teacher, so he was, he was going to give lectures on the Psalms. These went from 1513 to 1515. So Timothy George says, In the winter of 1512, Martin Luther began preparation for his lectures on the Psalms, 1513 to 1515, which were followed in turn by Romans, 1515 through 1516. Galatians, 1516 to 1517. Hebrews, 1517. And again, Psalms, 1518 to 1519. He later remarked, in the course of this teaching, the papacy slipped away from me. The catalyst that caused Luther to directly confront these issues However, was the church practicing what they called indulgences? Um, in, in Luther's time, the church was involved in the practice of selling indulgences. And they did this as a way to increase wealth, to get money for building projects and, and things like this. So they, they would sell indulgences, which were basically... Uh, if you bought these things, you could help your friend or relative get out of purgatory a little bit quicker. And um, so this little certificate basically came from the Pope and says, okay, get, get out of purgatory, not for free, but for this, this amount of money type deal. And um, so, so it extended to all sorts of things, to, to families of deceased relatives who desire to, um, to release their souls of their loved ones from purgatory. But it, it was specifically what was called a jubilee indulgence, which was authorized by Pope Leo X to, to pay for the, for the rebuilding of St. Peter's Cathedral, which really incited um, Luther to take action. He, he had enough. And so Luther, what he did, and it wasn't impulsive, this was... Um, studied and discussed um, over time. But uh, in, in the year 1517, on um, October 31st, which was All Hallows' Eve, um, the next day was All Saints' Day, and so this was the, the day before All Saints' Day, and um, uh, many would be attending the the services 
there at the castle church in Wittenberg, which was where Luther was. And um, what they would do in that day was on, on the door of the churches, they would utilize that as sort of their, um, well, their, their, their Facebook of their day. So they would post things that they wanted people to discuss. Right? So you, you see these guys who will uh, often post these uh, uh, kind of theological, controversial statements on Facebook. I don't know if you have that. I have guys that do that. Uh, you know, but they'll post these things because they want to want everybody now to discuss. They want you know, so you get 200 comments, and you know, everybody's going back and forth, and they. They never comment back. They just sit there and watch everybody arguing it out, you know, kind of deal. So it's an interesting phenomenon. But, but that's, that's the way we, we now, in our culture, we engage in theological discussions a lot of times. That's one of the ways. Well, in their day, their church doors would often serve that purpose. So they would, they would write disputations up, things they wanted to, the church or others to consider and discuss, and debate, and they would write this up and, and go and nail it on the church wall. And they didn't have cell phones to take a picture of it. Yeah. So what happened is that, that Luther did this on the day. He, he nailed it up uh, for discussion and for debate because he's, he's concerned about what exists in the church, what's going on. So he's, he's wanting reform. He's beginning to think that way. Okay, I can... I can make a difference with these kind of things. So he, he nailed what has been known as 95 theses, 95 arguments that, that he wants discussed and debated. And it seemed as if he, um, he didn't really expect a whole lot out of this um, on, the, on the major portion, anyhow. He just expected there would be some debate about this, and then they would go on and, and discuss, discuss it a bit more or whatever. Um, but, but there was something that, that made a huge difference. A new invention was called the printing press. And we'll, we'll come back to the printing press in a few minutes um, to, to discuss this a little bit more. But because of the printing press, these were now taken and circulated throughout Europe. And uh, so, of course, he got a lot of attention. He got the attention of the Pope, eventually, uh, with this. Um, well... Uh, a few years later, he would actually be, because of this, excommunicated uh, by the Pope. And, uh, and what this resulted in was a schism within uh, Roman Catholicism of that day, which has existed down to this day, which is the Protestant Reformation. And by 1530, that division was set, and there was, there was a an official statement of faith, known as the Augsburg Confession, which really began, quote-unquote, the first Protestant church, the Lutheran church as we know it now. So when, when Luther first comes to his understanding of some of these things, and his understanding of the gospel, he, he doesn't really seem to fully understand the consequences of this understanding. This is typically the way it is, right? We don't, we don't fully understand how dramatic these things are. Um, but in 1518, so those 1517, October 31st, 1517, in um, 1518, there was a, uh, which, by the way, I should have gone on there. There's your date, but I've said it a few times, so I think you've got that. And uh, then there was a, another big event was a meeting in 1518 with Cardinal Cajetan. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, Pope Leo sent his cardinal to convince the, the German princes uh, to undertake a crusade against the, the Turks, who were threatening Western Europe at this time, and, uh, and because he, he wanted them to agree to a tax to help fund uh, some of this. So... Um, the, the threat is, is so much, this is just a sort of interesting historical side note here, that uh, the Turkish threat is so much that, that Rome goes, part of what they're doing now is seeking reconciliation with the Hussites in Bohemia. 
saying, okay, because of these political reasons, this military issue, we want uh, to get reconciliation. So um, this cardinal is sent with this idea of, of accomplishing these purposes. And, and secondarily, he's given the task of meeting with Luther and forcing Luther to recant, because Luther is now becoming a, a thorn in the side of Roman Catholicism of the papacy, even in this short amount of, of time. And um, if Luther did not recant, he would be sent back to Rome as a prisoner. Well, the meeting didn't go well. The cardinal refused to discuss any of Luther's teachings. Luther thought he was going to be able to discuss some things with him, and the cardinal would not. He simply demanded Luther recant. And um, so when he found out that there was not going to be any kind of debate, Luther that is, and uh, that he was going to be forced to recant, he, he left. He secretly left um, the meeting. In 1519, um, he had a debate with John Eck. And uh, there, there's so much more uh, to it, so many more interesting things, and there's, there's a lot of good writings out there on Luther, and there's, um, there's, there's also some movies about Luther that if you haven't watched um, some of these, these good movies, I, I encourage you to do one. One that was made just a few years back, so it's, it's a very modern, well-done uh, movie called Luther. I encourage you to, to read that. And, and as you learn some of what I've learned, so it makes more sense as you watch the movie and you say, oh, yeah, that's, that's what was going on at that point, because obviously they have to move through things very quickly. Well, the, the emperor had died by uh, 1519, and um, um, the, the, the pope had, um, because of the, the death of the emperor, had postponed the condemnation of Luther, that God's providence often does these things, delays things. So, um, so he sent a representative to uh, Frederick, who is the, the ruler, the prince, over Germany. And he sent him a rare present of a golden rose. And... Um, and this representative of the Pope was authorized to negotiate with Luther at this time. And well, as he's journeying there to, for this meeting, the, the representative of the Pope finds out that, there's, that this movement is growing, that, that Luther is popular as he goes across the countryside. He sees all these people who are supportive of, of Luther, and there's tremendous sympathy for Luther. He, he said that he found three Germans on his side, especially in the north, to one against him. So that's, that's pretty strong support of Luther. Um, so um, he, uh, he sought to, to meet with Luther and, uh, and did meet with him. And uh, apparently they had a, a decent meeting where... Um, they, they tried to smooth things over, but of course it, it didn't last uh, for long because things were just too far gone with all of this. Um, so in uh, 1519, Luther receives a copy of John Huss's uh, On the Church. I mentioned that was his, his famous work. Um, and he, after reading it, he declares himself to be in fundamental agreement with, um, with Huss. Uh, this, the story goes, I'm not sure how compressed uh, the story is, but it's, it's an interesting thing that in his debate with uh, John Eck, that John Eck basically backed him into a corner and uh, backed Luther into a corner to where uh, Eck made the accusation against him that he was a Hussite, that he agreed with with John Huss, and Luther said, oh, no, I don't, no, I don't, I'm not on his side. And um, then um, at, at one of the breaks in the conference, and who knows, historically it may have been sometime later when he actually received these works, but the story goes that he went, went to the library and, uh, there and uh, got John Huss's work out and read it, and he said, oh, no, I'm a Hussite. You know? <laughs> so, uh, 
But whatever case, historically, he did agree with um, John Hess's view of, of the church at this point. So uh, just some, let me just hit some highlights of, for a couple years here of Luther's life. We can't cover his, his whole life, obviously. But um, in, so let me just run through a couple of very dramatic years uh, in his life, 1520 and then 1521. In January of 1520, Rome started the Inquisition against Luther and his ideas. On June 15th of that year, Pope Leo X issued a bull of excommunication. Uh, it's called a bull of excommunication, which is basically a, just a, a statement. It's just a, a written uh, ex excommunication. And uh, it was entitled, they gave titles to these um, bulls, as they call them, and it said, Arise, Lord, and defend thine own vineyard against a wild beast that is devouring it. Or a wild boar, sometimes it's, it's translated. Uh, so, very much concerned about Luther. He's given 60 days to recant or to be excommunicated. Um, October 6th of that year, Luther wrote the Babylonian Captivity which attacked the denial of the cup to the laity in the Holy Eucharist. They would withhold the cup. They wouldn't give the cup to the people. They'd only get the bread. And um, he disagreed with that for good reason. Um, he disagreed with the Mass as a sacrifice. The Mass in Roman Catholic theology is a sacrifice. And uh, he, he disagreed with that, that Christ is not sacrificed again. And he disagreed with the seven sacraments. He only held to two of the sacraments. Well, all of this is really, this is Luther against Rome, and there's no turning back at this point. Well, on October 10th, apparently uh, mail moved slow in those days. Uh, so even though Luther was given 60 days to recant back in June, he, he finally receives a papal bull at this point mm -hmm. in October. And um, he probably knew about it uh, earlier on in September at least, but uh, he receives it. In mid-October, just a few days later, at the University of Erfurt, students ripped up a copy of the papal bull and threw it into the water, and the university officials took no action against them. It shows Luther's support. November 12th, Luther's books are burned in Cologne, uh, burning of his book in other cities, burning of his books in other cities followed shortly thereafter because they're, they're told to get rid of all of his books. Right? He's a heretic at this point. And then December 10th, Luther burned the, a copy of the, paper bowl, the papal bull that he had received and other papal documents outside the walls of the city. He also burns books of church law and books written by his enemies. A lot of book burning going on in that day. All right. Okay, so... Um, 1521, January 3rd, Luther is excommunicated, officially. In February, um, the, the Frederick, his, his prince, uh, demands that uh, Luther not be imprisoned without getting a fair hearing, getting a chance to defend himself at a hearing. And so March 6th, the Emperor Charles V summoned Luther to appear before the Diet of Worms. In April 6, Luther begins the journey to Worms. He stopped along the way to preach in a number of different cities. On April 15, he entered Worms in a triumphal procession. A great crowd is gathered to hear him and cheer him on. April 17 is the first hearing at Worms, and um, an official points to a table of books and of, of Luther's books that he's written by this time, and asks Luther if he's willing to recant. He sees that some of his books are actually writings on the Scripture, and he says he's unwilling to recant uh, of those things, so he asks for a recess to consider this. Uh, so the next day, Luther says, makes his famous statement, unless I am convicted by Scripture, in plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, 
for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. And, and some versions have, he says, here I stand. It's this famous saying, there's debate as to whether he actually said that at that point or not. But it was, it, was, it was quite a stand. I mean, it was quite an obvious um, stand against Roman Catholicism. And he knew that he was in, in danger of losing his life, just like John Huss had um, at the council that he attended many years before. The emperor sides with Rome, with the Roman church, and wants Luther condemned immediately even though he had uh, promised safe counsel, safe, safe uh, passage to, to, to Luther, to his prince. Um, but the, uh, some of the other leaders there wanted to, Luther to have a few more days to recant. And so on April 25th, um, the, the council is dismissed, and uh, Luther leaves the negotiation room and says, I am finished believing that his life is now over with because of the condemnation. April 26, he leaves Worms as quietly as possible. <laughs> He's come in with a triumphal crowd. He now leaves quietly. And on the, on the journey back on May 4th, uh, a band of bandits uh, surround him and capture him. And uh, <clears throat> he's taken to Fortburg, the castle there. And uh, what has happened is that his prince, Frederick, has uh, instructed um, these bandits to capture him so that he will be made safe. He will be taken to a, to a safe place. And, uh, and he told them to take him someplace that he would not know where he was so he could say, hey, I don't, I don't know where Luther is, right? Uh, plausible deniability. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it's always existed, I think. And uh, so uh, it's also historically is presented as if Luther um, was surprised by this, but it's probably the case that he knew this was coming, that, um, that he'd been informed ahead of time that, um, that this was going to, he, he was going to be taken away to, to safety. Um, kind of does away with the excitement of the movies, but um, you know, the reality is that he probably knew. So May 10th, he arrives at Wartburg Castle, and he hides there for 11 months. And during that time, he grows his hair, grows a beard. He calls himself Knight George. Um, right, he's got to, got to take on a new identity. Uh, he's in hiding. And uh, it, while there, it's a tremendous struggle with him spiritually. He's struggling with the, the devil. Um, he's working on the German translation of the Bible. He wants to put the Bible in the vernacular of the people, in the language of, of the people. And so the New Testament is completed two years later, and the Old Testament ten years later. Um, <clears throat> while he's there, some of his, his followers uh, thought that he should have taken the Reformation further, and that he had just stopped halfway, and, and now they must complete what he had begun. And so they attempted to do so, and this turned into chaos. It turned into a revolution, basically, instead of a reformation. And uh, the only one who could stop it from going into complete and total chaos was Luther himself. And so he goes back to Wittenberg in disguise to start with and, and spends some time there, a few days, looking at what's going on. He later comes out of hiding and, and confronts his followers, who have become very radical at this point, um, in regard to a number of things, and he, um, it, it creates basically a split in the Reformation at that point. Now, the, um, the Peasants' War, is something that needs to be mentioned, uh, started in 1523 and went to 1525. The, the German peasants were basically slaves. Okay? They, they, had a, they, just, they, they didn't have anything to speak of. And uh, so they had they created some secret societies, basically labor unions of their day, to, to try to represent themselves better. And so things were building uh, in society you know, in a bad way. 
And um, this, this has been going on for, for a number of years. Even historians tell us back to 1476, there was uh, basically a, a, a sort of revolution, 1492, 1493, 1502, 1513, 1514. And all of these rebellions were put down by, by brute force and ended in a disastrous failure. And now they're, they're ready for another one at this point. Uh, and now they've got the teaching of Martin Luther. You know, this, this um, talk about Christian freedom. He talked about the priesthood of the believer. So if, if every believer is, is, has a certain Christian freedom, has, um, has individual responsibility before God, then you would think that would translate over into society at large, right? And so that's what many of his followers are saying. That's what many of these peasants are saying as well, that this should translate over into the, the civil realm as well. Um, there were traveling preachers going about, tracts being sent out, so just um, a lot of stirring up of the discontent. And, and the peasants would appeal to Martin Luther, and they would appeal to the Bible to, to be on their side to support their grievances. And, and they identified their cause, many of them did, with the restoration of genuine Christianity, true Christianity. This is a restoration of true Christianity, what we're calling for, pure Christianity. So you can see the impulse that is driving all this and how it's building up. And um, just to give one example, we're going to talk about the, the Radical Reformation a little bit more because this took place in Germany. This, this kind of sets the context. Thomas Munzer um, uh, considered himself an apostle, and uh, he, he uh, you know, fomented a lot of this uh, mindset as well that was going on in, in Germany. Um, the whole order of society was needed to be turned upside down, basic, basically in his view, and, and he believed that uh, he had new inspiration to bring about a, a new dispensation in the history of the church. Uh, he, he presented something, uh, a mindset, a worldview, which basically said that, um, that there should be uh, no priests, no princes, no nobles, no private property, but that everything should be shared, sort of a communistic type thing. Though, you know, again, we've got to take this in the, in the context of where it is. There's a lot of going back and forth, and a lot of misunderstanding, so... so how much of this was, was pure in what he was saying in regard to these things, you know, historians can argue about. But uh, whatever the case, he, he becomes popular, and uh, he would sign his letters with Munzer with the hammer and with the sword of Gideon. Uh, it was reported that he advised the killing of the ungodly. They had no right to live. That Christ brought the sword, not peace upon the earth. He said, look not on the sorrow of the ungodly. Let not your sword grow cold from blood. Strike hard upon the anvil of Nimrod, which were the princes. Cast his tower to the ground, because the day is yours. So again, it's not that, I don't, I don't know, I'm not an expert on it, but it's not that he's saying necessarily go out and kill everybody, but it's these princes. You know, the princes were the enemy. They were suppressing them in a horrible way. And, and to start with, this revolution that was beginning to occur was successful. Many princes, nobles, entire cities were forced to submit to the peasants. And if the middle classes, some historians say, if the middle classes would have gone over to the peasant side, it would have been a complete and total revolution and would have become irresistible, but they did not. And there were many appeals made to, to Martin Luther as the leader of the Reformation to join the side of the peasants. Uh, and really, it came down to the point that it seems as if the, the fate of the peasantry depended upon Luther himself. Now, he was the son of a peasant. <clears throat> and at first, he had considerable sympathy for their cause and advocated the meeting of many of their, their grievances that they had. But he, he was opposed to the use of force. He was always opposed to the, the use of force, except by the civil magistrates. Okay, so he took, took a, a strong uh, biblical view. He took, in other words, he pointed to the Bible and said, okay, you got Romans 13, you got passages like this that talk about 
the civil magistrate has a sword, not the people. Okay, so so if the government is going to to act this way, because with Luther, he's very much concerned about order. He's very much concerned that this that everybody just is not allowed to do whatever they want to do, and the masses are not allowed to do whatever they want to do. There's a certain order in place, and so he thought that the revolution itself was wrong, and it was contrary to God's design of things, and that it was the worst enemy of the Reformation. It would, it would be an, actually an enemy of what he was attempting to do, and it increased evil in a very dramatic way. So, so his reliance was upon God. He said, I'm just going to trust the preaching of the word. It'll go forth and do the power uh, of change. And um, so um, there, were, there were 12 articles put out by the peasants and uh, with their grievances, and he replied to that with an exhortation of peace. He said, and this was in 1525, May of 1525. He admitted that most of their grievances were, were just. He rebuked the princes and the nobles, especially the bishops, for their oppression of the poor and uh, their hostility to the gospel itself, and he urged them to grant some of the petitions because he was afraid that this revolution would just continue to grow. But at the same time, he warned the peasants against the revolution and reminded them that they should obey those in authority over them. <clears throat> and he reminded them of the passage in Matthew 26, 52, which says, They that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And so he, he advised both parties, let's get a committee of arbitration together, let's get this thing settled. But they, neither side would have any of it. And so there's about to be a massive war within Germany. <clears throat> and so Luther wrote against, he wrote a, 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 a writing against the murderous peasants, he called them. Because, I mean, <clears throat> they are going forth and, and killing people. There's, there's bad on both sides of this. But he charged them with doing the devil's work under the pretense of the gospel. And in some very violent words, and, and uh, people have, have really said of Luther that this was horrible, that he would write the response in which he, he did. Uh, but he did. He, he called upon the magistrates to stab, kill, and strangle them like mad dogs. Uh, he who dies in defense of the government dies a blessed death in a true martyr before God. Um, a pious Christian should rather suffer a hundred deaths than yield a hair of the, to the demands of the peasants. So he came down very strongly on the side of the, um, the magistrates and encouraged them that they needed to, to crush this rebellion with great force. And uh, they did. Um, of course, this, this was war. This was a civil war, if you want to call it that. And uh, the peasants didn't have a chance I mean, against the soldiers of the, the princes. And in a decisive battle in 1525, 5,000 peasants were slain on, on the field and in the, in the streets. Uh, 300 were beheaded before the courthouse. This was uh, Munzer's rebellion. And Munzer himself fled. He was taken prisoner, tortured, and executed. And uh, the peasants in South Germany, uh, also in battle, lost 18,000 in one battle. And the number of victims of the war itself uh, are believed to have exceeded 100,000. So this is a massive killing. And in, in the movie, the, the newest movie with Luther, you can see him struggling with this as he goes and he sees all of the dead uh, peasants who are before. So it was a horrible position to, to be in at that point for all involved. Um, this description of it, the surviving rebels were beheaded or mutilated, their widows and orphans were left destitute, over a thousand castles and convents lay in ashes, hundreds of villages were burnt to the ground, 
The cattle killed, agricultural implements destroyed, and whole districts turned into wilderness. Never, said Luther after the end of the war, has the aspect of Germany been more deplorable than now. So the cause of the Reformation is, is, um, is harmed, of course. The Roman Catholics are throwing all of this that happened in Germany on, onto the, uh, the Reformation itself. Erasmus comes out, the Pope comes out and says, see, this is what the Reformation gets you. This is what the Protestant Reformation will, will get you. And, uh, of course, many in Germany lose their interest in any kind of reform, whether it be religious, social, political, societal reform, whatever, you know, you can imagine uh, in, in a situation like that. And so in, Luther had um, now taken a position against any kind of, of revolution, and so it just created this, this terrible uh, situation um, in, in Germany at this time. And so it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Anytime we seek change and we seek reformation in the church, we seek reformation in society, it has consequences to it. There's suffering that occurs. We just can't think that this is going to be an, an easy, comfortable, pretty thing for us. It's not because transformation is occurring and there's going to be pushback against that. And, and what the church does is going to affect society and culture. And, and with the evil that is in the world and the sinfulness within the human heart, and then you multiply that by what we have in society and culture with, with millions and millions of people, and all the power play and selfishness and everything goes into us, there's going to be situations like this, and, and it's horrible to see, and, and we have to try to do the best that we can. We have to seek God's wisdom. We have to seek His face. We have to humbly seek to live before Him recognizing the evil that there is in this world. And that, that was the context that we see there. Now, we're out of time, and so I'm not going to uh, take any questions. We're just out of time. Anybody has something, we can talk afterwards. And I'll, I'll try to give time for questions uh, next time. But, uh, but we're not absolutely finished with, with Luther at this point. I do want to look at his, um, a little bit of his theology and the, the other effects on the church and worship and so forth when we we come back next time. And then, then we got a lot of other reformers to look at um, as well. So it'll be very interesting. So, so thanks for your time. And let me, let me dismiss this in prayer real quick. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had to, to learn more about the way that you work providentially in history. Lord, help us to, um, to be faithful servants of yours. To, to see our own lives reformed, the lives of our churches, the life of our society in which we live. I thank you for the attention of everyone here. May it be that we indeed have learned uh, from this and will continue to learn as we look at your providence over human affairs. And we pray this through Christ's name. Amen.